This is Breakpoint This Week, a weekly briefing on faith, culture, worldview, and mission with John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Well, welcome to Breakpoint This Week. We're going to be talking about the stories happening in our culture from a Christian worldview, just like we do each and every week here. Uh, Breakpoint This Week is a uh, a production of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Come to breakpoint.org. Org for more information. Glad to be joined here by Shane Morris. Shane, this is something, this is actually a historic moment. Now, this isn't going to mean anything to anyone listening because uh, our producers do such a great job that maybe our folks who listen don't even know that on most occasions you're recording from the great state of Florida. We're well over a thousand miles apart. Yeah, and I could be anywhere. Who knows? Like I right. might be in Colorado. I might be in uh, another country. I've done that. I might be in a parking lot, which actually <laughs> that has happened actually before. I think the most creative place I've ever recorded was in the parking lot of an abandoned barbecue restaurant in rural Tennessee. So that was pretty impressive. And then I drove to the nearest hotel and uploaded uh, all the digital. This is the glamour of, you know, radio work right here. I could tell you were at a barbecue joint, John, but I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> but today we're face to face. Like this has never happened before. It's a historic moment. Shane's out uh, joining us here in Colorado Springs as we uh, celebrate as a staff Christmas and uh, do kind of an all staff meeting. And so we're actually able to see each other in the face this week for the first time ever that we've ever done this so i feel like you're not, you're, not the first time we've ever seen each other face to face no that's true yeah we clear. should probably <laughs> clarify that but i do feel like you don't think it's quite as historic as i do i don't it's the millennial in me john it just doesn't everything's remote for me so it doesn't seem like uh that big of a deal yeah but i know for dinosaurs like you it does well it's, i appreciate you not dropping an okay boomer just then yeah, so that's, okay boomer. that's good because i'm yeah. not i'm an xer and the Xers are, are the ones who really screwed everything up, and no one ever talks about them. All right, so lots of stories to get to. I got emailed uh, maybe four or five times last week from different folks saying, did you see this, did you see this, did you see this? It was a Wall Street Journal piece, but, which basically uh, was titled, uh, Don't Believe in God? Uh, lied to your kids. We did a break point this past week, you and I, uh, on this, and it's a fascinating article about the fact that Christianity actually brings things, maybe, I guess the best way to say it, Christianity brings explanatory power to the universe that kids need, and they can't handle without. Right. Her, this is uh, by Erica Commissar is the um, name of the contributor, and her argument is that maybe there are adults out there who can handle the idea of, you know, just dying and turning to dust and worm food, but kids can't handle that. So in order to allow them to grow up to be productive members of society, well-adjusted adults and all that, you actually have to lie to them and tell them that there is transcendent meaning, there is a God, and there is a reason to be moral and to be in community, even if you don't believe those things. Yeah, and but see, here's the thing. It, you and I both thought about C.S. Lewis when we saw this, and because there's a number of C.S. Lewis lines. We gave two of them in the Breakpoint commentary this week. Uh, the third one that I thought of, though, uh, we didn't actually mention it, was um, in the commentary itself, was, you know, Lewis is talking about his own conversion, and he says, you know— I, and, I know the quote you're you know going to talk you're gonna about. Pull, you're going to talk about the bottle of port from uh, where he says, I didn't turn to Christianity to make me, myself happy. I always knew that a bottle of port would do that. Oh, I wasn't thinking right? about that, okay, one, yeah. but that's number four. Like, <laughs> right. we could have just dropped Lewis and the bombs all over the place. That's a great line. Yeah, a bottle of port can make me God happy. in the dock. That's, it's yeah, that's the right. Dock. That's right. No, I was actually thinking about when he said, you know, an atheist can't be too careful these days. Right. In other words, when he uh, starts dipping his toe and even using Christianity, mm-hmm. uh, you, you know, the, the, it's going to come back and get you. And I, that's the first thing that I thought of. But you had brought up, uh, in addition to the, uh, you know, a bottle of pork can make me happy. I don't need Christianity to do that. That's a great one. I had forgotten all about that one. But the line of, you know, look, at the same time, there has been throughout history this idea of using Christianity in order to make the world a better place, in order right. to improve society. And there's a line where Lewis says, look, that's not what's on offer here. God's not going to be mocked that way. That's not actually doable. Yeah, you're using him as a means to an end when you do that. And the line is from the screw tape letters where um, – Screwtape tells uh, his nephew that essentially people who try to use God as a means for societal reformation are, might as well use the stairway of heaven as a shortcut to the nearest pharmacy. God is not going to be used as a means to an end like that. He is an end in and of himself, the end, the greatest end. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing was just this idea that um, 
you know, what does this say about faith? I think a lot of people read the article and they sent it to me like, this, look at what it says about faith. You know, that faith uh, helps us explain the world better. Faith will help your kids. You should even rely on it if it's not true. You know, sometimes I hear believers even say that, right? Like, even if it's not true, I'm going to pretend like it is because yeah, it's better than it is. that's the argument. Yeah. But I thought in, what we put in the break point was that this is a bigger problem for unbelief. Because what we're literally saying here is that a skeptical, cynical worldview can't handle the details of the world, especially when those details are are hard, when the suffering comes, when there's pain, when there's death. There's a very, very important line, and I think it's even more important now, uh, given the spike in the suicide rate across America, that, you know, you can— live without water, you know, X amount of, you know, hours. You can live without uh, food X amount of hours, but you can't live without meaning for another minute. In other words, when you really hit that meaningless and you have access to uh, some sort of means to kill yourself, then that's it. And this is a real problem. Take it seriously. If your worldview doesn't have the goods to deliver the why of life, when it's at its most confusing and its most difficult, time to move on, man. Time to go to the, time to go to something that can explain it. Yeah, you need an entirely different set of tools to deal with reality in that case. And that's what we keep coming back to C.S. Lewis, but arguably his most powerful idea in all of his writing is that our deepest desires are a clue to the meaning of the universe and to our purpose as human beings, right? And he has this line where he talks about ducks desiring water. And then he says, well, I find in myself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy. And the most logical conclusion, given that, is that I was made for another world. Or as we added in the commentary, another worldview. And that idea that your desires are a clue to the meaning of reality is throughout his work. I think of the um, the famous scene in Underland where the children in in Puddle Glum are dealing with the Lady of the Green Kirtle. And she convinces them that everything they, they love and know and cherish is really just an illusion. It's a child's game. And Puddle Glum comes forward at the end of all of it, and he says, okay, all that said, maybe we have made up all these things, you know, the sky and the sun and the trees and Aslan himself. But even if that's the case, I still want to believe in them because they're better than this terrible dark hole of a world you've made. And a lot of people, I think, mistake the argument he's making there as this sort of Santa Claus argument that, well, we should believe in them because they make us feel good. But mm-hmm. the argument Lewis is making there is that Puddle Glum's right. Those things really do exist. And his desire for them and his memory of them are a clue to their uh, reality, their truth. And so folks who write stuff like this, I, I wonder if they ever back up and ask themselves, maybe my desires, or rather, I, I think um, the author of this is a believer in Judaism uh, in particular, but I wonder if the secularist reading would back up and ask themselves, hold on, if my worldview can't account for these things, Maybe it's not the truth. Yeah, and we're not talking about, you know, a worldview not being able to account for a sort of a abstract, obscure new theory of nuclear physics, right? I mean, right. we're talking about meaning. We're talking about the universal thing that has shaped all of human literature. You know, art has shaped our human conversations, our interpersonal relationships, has shaped our religious impulses uh, from the very beginning of time. Like, like this is the most fundamental part of the human experience other than the fact that we exist itself uh, that has to be explained. And then it is a place where atheism falls short. Come to breakpoint.org. Click on the link on the homepage that says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast. And we'll link you not only to this article, Don't Believe in God, Lie to Your Kids, uh, from Erica Kamazar at the Wall Street Journal, but also our Breakpoint commentary talking about it. You're listening to Breakpoint This Week. I'm John Stone Street here with Shane Morris. We'll be right back. Hello, Breakpoint listeners. My name is Brooke Boriak, and I am the program coordinator for the Colson Fellows Program. Every day I get to work with Colson Fellows who have joined the family of believers dedicated to making an impact in their spheres of influence. Your generous donations go directly toward the effort to equip Christian leaders. Please join myself and hundreds of others in supporting the movement of kingdom builders. Make your year-end gift at breakpoint.org slash podcast. Back on Breakpoint this week, John Stone Street here along with Shane Morris. Uh, Shane, in a week where uh, so much of the news was dominated by the article of impeachment filed by the House Democrats and the continuing uh, theater that is uh, taking place there, President Trump signed on Wednesday an executive order having to do with uh, what he's calling a kind of a growing or a prevalent anti-Semitism. And, you know, specifically, I think he's talking about 
an order that allows the president to deal with kind of the divestment movement, pulling out of the state of Israel and that sort of stuff. But it is coming at a really interesting time earlier this week. I mean, a really interesting and tragic time. You and I were talking about this earlier today with some of our Breakpoint colleagues, which is just like, where does this prevalent, historic, repetitive discrimination against a people group and hatred for a people group come from? It's like it never goes away. We know it's the source of one of the great evils of the 20th century. But, you know, there was a shooting in New Jersey that is being investigated, at least at the time here, that we're having this conversation as a, a, an act of anti-Semitic uh, terror. Yeah. You know, here in Colorado, just about an hour south of where you and I are sitting right now, uh, a young man was caught with intentions to blow up a, uh, a Jewish synagogue, a mm-hmm. uh, historic Jewish synagogue. Uh, and then about an hour and a half north of where we're sitting in Boulder, Colorado, and this was just in the last you know couple weeks, young men dressed as Hasidic Jews passing out anti-Holocaust literature. We certainly have the Tree of Life Synagogue and, and other things. Um, so there's lots of things to talk about. I, I don't really want to talk about the merits of the executive order itself. I will tell you that in my recent visit to Israel and spending time over there, they are President Trump fans. I mean, for example, the move of the embassy to Jerusalem, we might look at that and go, you know, why is that a big deal? I'll tell you, they think it's a really, really big deal. They think it's a very, very important move. And so they, they are very supportive of President Trump, yet he still often gets a reputation for being anti-Semitic, which has never made sense to me. Before we get into that, though, and I'm not even sure whether that's worth getting into, the thing I want to get into is what is it that is behind this prevalent evil ideology in all of its various forms that never seems to go away in human history? Yeah, anti-Semitism continues to rear its ugly head despite all all of the uh, you know demonstrations of it, of the spectacular nature of that evil. I mean, you, you'd think after the 20th century we would be done with anti-Semitism, but we're not. It just continues to uh, surface. And the thing we were talking about in the uh, a meeting earlier is where where does this come from? It's a haunting question. Where does hatred for the Jews come from? And I think that perhaps there's a a detailed historical analysis to be had there, but there's something more uh, more simple to say. And one of our colleagues, Roberta Rivera, brought up this, and I think it was from Hannah Arendt originally, and she suggested that anti-Semitism as a Western reaction, as distinct from like an Islamic reaction, because Islamic anti-Semitism, you could argue, is, is more of a, of a family feud of sorts. Uh, and Western anti-Semitism, she describes as um, a reaction to the fact that Jews are an uncomfortable reminder that Western civilization is deeply indebted to um, that people group, that we owe an inexhaustible uh, debt to Jewish monotheism, to Moses, to Jerusalem. Uh, the fact that we, you know, Europeans didn't civilize themselves. They were civilized by, by an influence from this, uh, this Middle Eastern religion, an obscure part of, uh, an otherwise obscure part of the world. Um, and it changed all of history. That, that would be an expression of arrogance. And that to me is maybe the maybe the best potential explanation for why anti-Semitism just as a European phenomenon, you know, as a Western phenomenon, just keeps on surfacing again and again, even in, uh, you know, surprising places and surprising times. Yeah, I mean, I, even when I was in Israel, the thing I, I kept thinking is, you know, how much this little piece of land has been at the center of the whole story of human history and conflicts in human history. You know, people wanted it. Now, at some level, it is at a crossroads, right? It's a very strategically located piece of land in terms of access to shipping routes and access to bodies of water and and so on. And, you know, found itself in between enormous empires. But at the same time, it's like, you know, even that kind of is a kind of a side, you know, a side swiping piece of evidence for this truthfulness of uh, of the story of Scripture and that God had a special calling for Abraham and his people, and that at some level, they are the ones at the center of the whole deal. You know, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, where I was just there a couple weeks ago, and then we're in the Holocaust Museum in America, they both uh, start the story of anti-Semitism, however, and this is something that has to be dealt with. 
with uh, Christianity, with Christians seeing Israel and the Jews as those who killed Christ, mm. and that that kind of set them, and, and those who rejected Christ, and then also responsible for the death of Christ, uh, which of course is a theologically uh, completely uh, indefensible concept. Mm. Not that they rejected Christ, that's true, but that the killers of Christ, as opposed to all of us. At the same time, I, um, that's where both of those, uh, you know, museums start the story. We know very anti-Semitic comments coming from Martin Luther, for example, and other folks in Christian uh, history. And so that's part of our own history that we've got to reckon with as well. You know, there may be a fruitful distinction to make there, John, between um, what I've heard called anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. I've heard it suggested that anti-Semitism as a racial animosity is sort of a newer thing that uh, emerged within the last few centuries, whereas anti-Judaism is clearly older and, and something that the church has been complicit in for you know, centuries, <clears throat> Martin Luther being the most obvious example for two Protestants having written on the Jews and their lies. And if you read that, the interesting thing is that Luther is not, um, you know, he's not speaking in terms that would be familiar to a Nazi, although the Nazis certainly used his, his propaganda right. to great effect. He is speaking in religious terms there. He's essentially saying, I hate these people because they've rejected the faith. And that's not a Christian or, or a moral reaction. You know, that's deeply sinful and evil. But I do think it's honest historically to distinguish that from the related but different phenomenon of anti-Semitism as a racial concept, the, the argument that the Jewish race is somehow you know, inferior or all the arguments that the Nazis made. Right. I mean, if you fast forward to today, now we're talking about something completely different, right? And this is, I think, what the executive order from President Trump is trying to at mm. least directly address is the most anti-Israel place on the planet are American universities. Uh, I drove by the UN the other day and, you know, they're on the defense of the United Nations is not only something that it's pro-Palestinian, but basically something that set the Palestinians up as the complete victims of anything from the state of Israel. And, of course, you see stories on college campuses of uh, pro-Israel speakers, even those that are as secular and liberal on every other issue being, uh, you know, um, uh, shouted down and made unsafe. And Palestinian terrorists held up as heroes mm -hmm. on university campus. And so the new face of, of that kind of anti-Semitism, at least, seems to be getting most of its energy from, uh, you know, the woke college campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could distinguish as well between, like, the political claims of it. it this is where it gets so sticky, John. When you're dealing with um, the complaints at college campuses and the uh, the divestment movement from Israel, the, the, or the movement to— uh, you know, to condemn the state of Israel. You're dealing with uh, a mix of, I think, good old-fashioned anti-Semitism or bad old-fashioned anti-Semitism and, um, you know, political claims. The state of Israel is not perfect. They've made mistakes, and I think we ought to be honest and um, be willing to condemn abuses when they happen. But neither, um, you know, neither are the Palestinians and the various groups innocent either. And so there's a, you make the distinction between a political claim and a claim of outright just hatred for not only the state of Israel, but Jewish people as a whole. I, I think maybe the root of this, it could be spiritual. Um, like you alluded to earlier, there's something in the fact of the Jewish race, identity, religion, whatever you want to, however you want to parse it, that is offensive to the forces of darkness. Uh, my grandfather, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, liked to put it this way. He said that when Satan looks at the Jews, he sees Jesus. He sees the image of the Messiah, and he hates that, and he wants to stomp it out. Yeah, I think that's a powerful, uh, you know, kind of thought. Um, the reactions to the uh, executive order have been somewhat mixed. Uh, the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, called it, uh, you know, an important way to reaffirm protections without infringing on First Amendment rights. Mm. Uh, but several other progressive Jewish advocacy groups are seeing it as a stifling thing on uh, free speech, mainly because it really uh, divests uh, uh, governmental interests from the what's called the BDS movement, it stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, a movement to end any sort of international support for, quote, Israel's oppression of Palestinians. So it's going to be interesting kind of to watch this stuff uh, play out. Well, we've got more to talk about uh, here on Breakpoint this week. This is John Stone Street along with Shane Morris. Stay with us. Hello and happy holidays. My name is Pam Randall, and I am the assistant to the president, John Stone Street, here at the Colson Center. 
For the past two and a half years, I've been a witness to God's blessing on this ministry through the generosity of thousands of people like you dedicated to the work of the Colson Center. We want you to know that your donations of any amount are celebrated and multiplied in prayer. We're so grateful for your generosity. Please make your year-end gift today at breakpoint.org slash podcast. Back on Breakpoint this week, John Stone Street here along with Shane Morris. Shane, there was a big dust-up on Twitter this week that many people may have missed if you're not on Twitter. And I always tell people, if you're not on Twitter, Stay don't on. start. Yeah, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't join. Uh, but, uh, you know, very popular and edgy um, Twitterer is Catholic commentator Matt Walsh. And um, he started, I guess, launched a debate over whether the government, it's time for the government to step in and fight pornography. And of course, this uh, within the conservative circles shows one of the divides among the kind of the right spectrum of society where you have at one level social conservatives who see socially conservative views as inherent to the conservative position. In other words, not just economic things, not just kind of the scope and role of government, but fundamentally uh, moral positions on controversial issues. And then also what you might call the more libertarian side of the spectrum, which, uh, you know, the smaller the government and maybe if it's not there, the better, you know, and um, slash it, slash it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And I find myself almost always saying if it can be a smaller government, the better. Right. I mean, I think that that's almost always true. But it really, uh, I think, created a big uh, debate. And and it also, I think, separates people, largely people of faith from um, people who don't have faith uh, in terms of people who have kind of a a moral framework that comes from deeply held beliefs about God and salvation and human sin and those that don't. I have talked and spoken out on kind of the evil of pornography for a long time. I mean, several years ago, I found myself on a panel with a very prominent uh, Jewish commentator named Dennis Prager. Prager is a brilliant guy, and we've talked about many of the things, his more recent projects. But you know, he mentioned on a panel that, you know, you know, oh, my dad had playboys laying around the house and, you know, what big deal? What, what's the big deal? And I know our Christian audience would be like, what? And that's kind of it was kind of surprising. I remember my wife was there. She was like, I can't believe he actually said that. And Hewitt, who was moderating the conversation, told me later that, you know, Dennis and Chuck Colson had gotten that conversation at more than you know one occasion. But Dennis's point was like, you know, hey, this is, you know, the sexual impulse is just kind of part of the man. What's the big deal? One of the things I was telling him is like, look, uh, we can argue about whether uh, the government should step in and take down, you know, Playboy in 1957. But what we're talking about now is something thoroughly and completely different. I heard a story this past week that I can't even really tell on the radio having to do with the depths of depravity at which pornography has corrupted an honor society student who's 15 years old. I mean, I couldn't even describe this to you. It was so shocking. I I lost sleep over this one. But th- see, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a level of abuse. We're talking about a level of uh, predatory ways in which porn targets young people. That certainly is nothing, nothing, nothing like what was happening in the 1950s. I mean, porn has become a scourge on society that's it's unparalleled, at least in that category. Uh, on individual souls, families, I think in civilization itself, to be honest. So there's, you get no argument from me whatsoever that this is a, an absolute scourge on society. But you and I sort of come up at this from a little bit different angles because I'm more on that libertarian end of things or, or that classical liberal end of things where I'm not sure that something being bad is enough reason to, you know, to get the government involved to ban it or shut it down. And there's an example I like to use to sort of illustrate that is that I can't think of anything worse than um, people being persuaded to disbelieve the gospel or disbelieve in God. So like, you know, an atheist, a Richard Dawkins type comes and writes a book and says, you should stop believing in God for all these reasons. And then people read him and deconvert. Well, I mean, the medieval church saw that and they said, that's, that's soul murder. You're killing people. That's the worst thing for human flourishing you could possibly do. But I think you and I would agree that having the government step in and shut down Dawkins and burn his books wouldn't be a proper use of government. That would be outside of its you know, rightful role. So the worldview question that, that we have to ask, I think, is what's the role of government? Where does it step in to restrain evil? And then where is it 
that left to society. Right? Yeah, that is the point of disagreement. And, and we had, a, I think, a really robust and good conversation about this earlier today because, uh, you know, if we were to kind of simplify the disagreement between social conservatives and libertarians, it's uh, libertarians say the government's role is to prevent bad things from happening, to protect its citizens. That's it. Anything beyond that, it's going to do it poorly and it should stay out of it. On the other hand, um, social conservatives say that there's a governmental role in terms of advancing the common good, that it should be on the side of things that are good for us as well. Now, I think that can be argued, and I would come down on that position because I think government is something that was put together prior to the fall. I think, you know, as part of the human experience, if we were going to live together, manage the creation mandate together, and do what God created us to do, you're going to have some level of management that's going to be needed. And it's going to look, because the fall hasn't happened, nothing like TSA, for example. Okay? <laughs> so uh, on the other hand, if I even just took the libertarian uh, side of things and just said, look, government's only role is to protect its citizens, I think pornography has so quickly and so dramatically jumped over that line into now not just getting in the way of the social good, but actually literally directly harming people, especially children. And just like I think, you know, the government should step in and criminalize uh, sex reassignment surgery for minors right. because I think it's child yeah. abuse. And I told, in fact, this was the example I used on the panel, you know, years ago with uh, Dennis Prager. I said, you know, look, if I were walking down the street with my kids and a man just flashed them, that's it. Everyone would agree he should be arrested. He should be put in jail. Yeah, that's a course. form of sexual assault. Well, our kids are just walking down their phones, you know, on the Internet, and they're not looking for it. The average uh, exposure for pornography is uh, – first exposure for pornography for Internet users six years ago was eight years old, and it's just getting younger, and it's just getting more violent, yeah. and it's just getting more corrupt. And I think this is what led to a conversation that took place in the U.K., you know, eight or nine years ago, and it was kind of a – a version of the same debate that happened on Twitter this week where uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, I think it was Tony Blair at the time, proposed – it might have been David Cameron actually – proposed that just internet companies should have a default setting of blocking pornography for users unless people opt in. And you'd have thought he was, you know, completely trampling on free speech. You know, right. it's like, no, no, no. I'm not even saying like it shouldn't be available. I mean, Iceland proposed that years ago that it shouldn't be available at all. Just make a guy admit it, like make him opt in. And uh, and it was, you know, shut down and so on and so on. But the reason that even those proposals were offered was because of the dramatic damage that was being done to young people. And there was a couple of high profile crimes. This is what st stunned me, Shane about the debate on Twitter this week is even modest suggestions, right? Because, look, should the government have stopped Hugh Hefner from publishing his magazine is one question. Should the government step in now, given the violent pedophilia, mm -hmm. anti-women's uh, uh, dignity stuff that we see today, and the predatory nature where it basically jumps into your head and in front of your eyeballs, whether you look for it or not. Right. That's a completely different conversation. And anything limiting that, boy, it sets some people off as if, you know, we were, you know, trying to become China. Yeah, that doesn't really make sense to me because, I mean, there's a very strong small government position, libertarian, whatever you want to call it, to be argued for shutting that sort of thing down. I mean, sure. there's a reason you don't see uh, pornography on billboards. You see something pretty close to it in some places, but um, there's a reason they can't actually post nudity in public places because that's obscenity and there are obscenity laws and that's an assault on people's eyeballs, right? You know, you didn't choose to right. uh, look at that. You didn't search uh, for a website. You didn't click on a link. You're just driving down the road. You have a right not to be assaulted with that sort of thing. People who flash you, same sort of thing. So yeah, I agree with you 100% that that sort of thing should immediately be shut down and the government has a role in preventing what amounts to sexual assault or, or coercion or manipulation or even the kind of slavery and blackmail you often see at the gateway to the porn industry. And there's that's a question that conservatives should be debating is where is this coercion taking place? Where is this abuse taking place that where this is seeping into your homes in a way that no longer looks like even the most libertarian or anarchist conceptions of freedom. Yeah, that's exactly right. And for the record here, we're running out of time, but I think you and I would both agree that 
the church should absolutely step in on this problem and offer discipline for you know for members that are, that are caught in this. Yeah, and that's help the positive for, for side. Of this. Yeah, exactly. That's the positive mean, side. This the, should come from society. There's yeah. things that the government can't do. That it right. actually has to come from the church and from uh, you know families, communities, cities, what have you. Well, with that can of worm open uh, <laughs> and, and worms spilling everywhere, uh, we'll call it a, a program. You've been listening to Breakpoint this week. Uh, I'm John Stone Street here along with Shane Morris. Come to Breakpoint.org and click on the link on the homepage. It says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast, and we'll link you to the different articles that we talked about on today's program. And join us again next time as we talk about what's happening in the culture from a Christian worldview. 